Okay, let's get to the show. And uh, let's begin, as we always do, by going to the only one who knows what's going on. And that is our God, King, and Creator of time and space. He's the only one. So let's call upon Him. Father in Heaven, we thank You for tonight. We pray that your, your spirit, your power, your wisdom, your discernment would just overflow us and move us. And who's ever listening, wherever they are, whatever they're going through, you would just comfort them, deliver them, inspire them, correct whatever we need, Lord. Let us, let us feel you tonight and give the winds a mighty voice in Jesus' name. Amen. And just so you guys know, I don't know if you all do, but I have another Facebook page which is for my, that promotes my, my counseling practice and a couple of the books that I wrote. It's called Depression, Anxiety, and the Child of God. If you haven't uh, liked that or friended me on that page, that page is where I specifically post things and links that have to do with depression, anxiety, uh, and any type of emotional things that we go through. And uh, don't forget, if you want to get my books, you can get them on Amazon, or you can ask at your local bookstore, Depression, Anxiety, and the Child of God, Part 1, Depression, Anxiety, and the Child of God, Part 2, The Daily Devotional, and Spiritual Living in a Sexual World. Um, and if I ever have time, I, I have so many other books that I like, that I have started, that I never finished. I would like to, before I die, at least write one more book, and I have an idea for a title, The Odd God and the Odd People Who Follow Him. Uh, kind of a play on words, kind of like clickbait, but uh, I'm just thinking about writing a book about that the other day, so we'll talk about that. Anyway, okay, to the show, Facing Adversity, Part 3 in our series, and uh, tonight is self-control. Now, anybody out there have any problems with self-control, okay? Or are you guys always in control? Is everybody out there always in control? You're in control of your mind, body, and spirit? Because I'm not. Sometimes I'm not, and that's a problem, okay? It is a problem. Do you know, and it might sound strange, but self-control is a major part of facing adversity, okay? Often, when we're facing adversity, we do tend to lose our temper, okay? Uh, let's see here. Jennifer says, uh, I'm not in control sometimes, <laughs> Uh, yes, I am not in control sometimes. And you know what? That could be good and, and can be bad. It all depends on who is in control. Is it something else that is in control? Someone else that's in control? Is it a emotion that's in control? Because it shouldn't be. The only one that should be in control is God. See, when God's in control, everything goes the way it's supposed to. But what happens when we lose control? Well, you can lose control in a positive way if you relinquish it to God, but what I'm talking about is losing control when we lose our tempers, when we just, just go crazy and we just start lashing out, okay? And I'll give you an example here. Uh, they said that if you, if a bear or many other animals, even a mouse, if they get their leg caught in a trap, they will actually bite their leg off. They will sit and they will because they'll be in such a panic. <laughs> Sally's laughing. Don't no milk through the nose. <laughs> they, <laughs> they will actually, in a panic, be so afraid that they're trapped there, that they will eat their own leg right off to escape, okay? And you know what? That's something that we do sometimes. When we get into a panic mode, we end up thrashing because we're in a panic and we cause more harm than good. Many times when people, and they train people, I hear, if you're a lifeguard out there, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard from lifeguards that 
The biggest fear of a life god is trying to save someone who is out of control. They're thrashing and they're freaking out and they'll actually bring the life god down with them. They have to kind of like slap the person in the face to get them to calm down or I can't save you. And that's what we do many times in life. We do do that. You know, I'll be glad when we get that new microphone because I don't have to keep on moving this thing and looking at my notes here. Okay. Also about control. Sometimes when we lose control, we actually make the situation worse than the actual situation that we're freaking out about. Okay. See, because when we lose control, that's not success, that's disaster. Losing control is not success, that's disaster. What does Marion say? She says, I'm in control of anger, thank you, Lord. Very, very rare other areas. Okay, that's good, because anger is a tough one. Anyway, in this series called Facing Adversity, and remember, our series title Usually, all my titles usually have a little, a little, a little caveat to them. Uh, facing adversity with victory. Okay, that's what this series is called, and we've been talking about this for many weeks now. And I've told you guys, there are two ways to lose, because that's the first thing you have to understand. There are going to be situations in life that are not going to go your way. If you don't think that's ever going to happen, then you haven't lived on planet Earth long. There are going to be situations that are not going to be favorable to you. Okay? And by the way, for those who are listening on YouTube, don't forget to click your subscribe button, thumbs up, thumbs down, and the notification bell so you don't miss any future broadcasts. But anyway, when you are in a situation that you are going to lose... Well, there are two ways to lose, and I've been trying to tell you guys this. The first way is to walk away from a bad situation, a loser. Okay? Or, the second way is to walk away from a bad situation, a loser, yes, you lost, but with a piece of wisdom, a piece of wisdom clenched tightly in your hands. You have to steal virtue. You have to grab wisdom from the bad time that you went through so it's not wasted. And that makes you less of a loser. I mean, you still lose in some situations, but you come out on the other side a victor if you leave with something that you learn from it. Because you can walk away from something destroyed and completely worse than you were before, or... You can come away from it. Yeah, you lost, you got hurt, whatever, but you came away wiser. You see, you're not a loser if you come away wiser. Now, I shared earlier about the $6 million man. When I was a young boy, uh, I would say, I don't know, maybe like fifth or sixth grade, I used to love the $6 million man show. And if any of you people remember how it used to go, the opening clip was, and this is how it read, Steve Austin, an astronaut, a man, buried alive. But we can rebuild him. We can make him better than he was. We can make him faster, stronger. Steve Austin will be that man. Now, I know it's a silly show, and it didn't really happen, but we can appropriate. You know what? <laughs> it's a funny thing. Every once, I, I have this thing on uh, this thing about big words. I like to learn big words that I never knew before. And lately, my big word is appropriate. Appropriation. It seems everywhere I go, I've been using it, and I've been seeing it in things that I'm reading. You see, we can appropriate. A wisdom. We can appropriate knowledge if we put a heart to it. And let's take the silly show, The Six Million Dollar Man. Okay? Hey, Dawn. I just see you popped up there. Okay? Now, case in point with this show, what did Steve Austin gain, okay, from this big explosion, this 
spaceship crash, whatever it was. Well, he gained two new super legs, one right super arm and one right super eye. But what did he have to lose to gain those? He had to lose two legs, he had to lose one arm, and he had to lose one eye. In the pilot episode, if you've ever seen it, and the original show was called Cyborg, I think it was called, and the original episode, when he crashes and they go through how it happened, when he wakes up, because what happens, he's, you know, he loses his two legs, his arm, in a horrible crash, and one eye, and they decide to, without his permission, okay, they put him into surgery, and the military attaches these mechanical bionic legs, an arm, and an eye. Now, when he wakes up, he doesn't like what happened. He feels like he's a monster. He wants to die. He throws things around and he gets crazy and he loses control until he understands, until he's able to calm down and listen, until he understands. He feels that he lost, and he's angry, and he's all freaking out. But he has to learn that he has won. He didn't lose. He has won if he appropriates victory from the loss. People, if there's anything that I can share with you that you can take away, is the next time you go through something hard, or... Maybe you just did something hard. Instead of coming away from it and going, man, I got burnt, I got hurt, I got whatever, financial, emotional, whatever it is, physical. I always do this. Whenever I go through something that's really hard and bad, I always ask God, okay, what was that all about? Why? There has to be a purpose. I don't want to waste it. I want to appropriate virtue out of it, okay? And if you listen to any of my Jeep stories, you'll know what I'm talking about. I'm always appropriating things from disaster, okay? Now, the reason why this is important, getting back to our topic, losing control, is that in our crazy world that we live in, and in the crazy lives that we all live to some degree, okay, we have got to stay in control, people, because it's easy to snap. And I think more and more people are beginning to snap. People are not remaining in, the, you know, in control. Okay, they were keeping calm. Everybody's keeping calm. Okay, I hear what's going on. Let me give it time for it to work itself out. But it, the longer things go and they get worse, we're getting impatient, aren't we? Because and, and isn't that the catalyst for losing self-control? is impatience. I don't have patience for this. I'm not going to put up with this. Right? True. I mean, let's be honest, people. We talk about road rage, right? When someone's in front of you going slow. How about, do you ever have, like, a shopping cart rage when the person in front of you is going too slow? Or you're walking in a store? Did you ever get annoyed? Like, get out of my way. Right? That usually happens if you live in New York, okay? We're always in a rush, us New York people. But we lose control easily, right? Lose control easily. You guys with me? You guys still out there? Let me see a thumb so I know I'm not alone talking to nothing. Okay, just, just checking. I saw Marion said yes. Okay. I want to share something, and one of the things you guys always know is that uh, whether it's a quality or it's a fault, I don't know. I like to think it's a virtue, but I do wear myself on my sleeve, and, and I tell you all of my secret faults. And another one, I should write a book, you know, 600, uh, this is secret fault number 622 of Pastor Scott. Another one of my secret faults. 
Okay, I have had anger problems in the past. Big, ugly anger problems. Out of control. Throwing things, acting irrational, saying stupid, bad things that I shouldn't say. And you know what I've learned from that? You know what losing control does, people? They solve nothing. They cure no problems. They don't repair a thing. And they don't give you peace. But they take it away. Do you know losing control? And what I mean about losing control is losing our temper. Because that's normally what losing control is. And we all lose our tempers to different degrees. But when we lose control, well, I, I should really do it this way. When we lose our tempers, we lose control. That's a better way of saying it. And when you lose control, there is no control. It's like you're driving your car down the road. When you take your hands off the wheel, that's losing control. Do you think your car is going to handle better with you out of control or your hands on the wheel in control? When we lose control because we lose our patience, because we get hurt, because someone said something, someone did something, whatever it is, you don't get better by losing control. Things always go worse. Now why do we do it? Well, it's kind of a knee-jerk thing. It's like we don't care. We don't care. Sometimes we actually enjoy being out of control. And we want to get out everything mean and nasty. We normally have a lot of malice when we do that. Uh, we usually get out all the digs, and that's the problem. Usually when we get out of control because we lack patience, we usually begin to say things that we always wanted to say, but we kept them quiet. And sometimes we say things to people, and, and people, you I mean, this is, I didn't make this up, but it's true. Once words get out of that mouth, you can never take them back. Ever. Ever. Okay? It's, it's like the proverbial toothpaste tube. Okay? I still use a toothpaste tube. You know, you can squeeze toothpaste out really easy, but you can never get the toothpaste back in. Have you ever tried to get toothpaste back into a toothpaste tube? It's impossible. It's almost impossible. Okay? And you know what's really sad? Normally when we, not all the time, but many times when we lose our temper and lose control, we do it to the people we love. Because we don't want anyone else to see what we're really like. Okay, so we stay in control. You know, me as a pastor, I have to put on this facade that I'm really holy and perfect, <laughs> but you guys know I'm not. So you will rarely see me get out of control. Maybe some of you have. I've got pretty riled up in some of my sermons. Uh, but for the most part, I try to keep it under control. But when it comes to my family, you know, uh, I remember many, many years ago with my oldest son, and he, you know, reminded me of it, and I forgot about it. That I don't know, maybe he was like 11 or 12, and I remember losing my temper with him, and I was just screaming just not nice things to him, calling him bad things. And and he remembered that the rest of his life. And he brought that back up. And I had to say, I am so sorry, son. That was a bad thing I did. That was wrong. I have no excuse. I can't go back. I can't change it. All I can do is say, I'm sorry. And let's take it from here. But you know what? I wish I could go back. So why did I get so happy? Because no, we were out in the woods working with these quads, and he was doing something dumb, and he got stuck, and I was so angry with him. I lost my, you know, I lost my patience with him, and I lost control. And it's a real sad thing. But also this, when it comes to rage, because remember, we lose our patience, we lose control to different degrees. You know, we can lose control to different degrees. Some people, when they, you know, when they get impatient, they be quiet and they put on that stoic face. 
Some people get verbal. Some people use obscenities. Some people start pushing things around. Some people start to throw things. I have thrown things in my day, okay? <laughs> and had to walk away, especially when I'm working on something mechanical, okay? But also, with the rage factor, remember this. It is impossible to make a good choice in the heat of rage, Okay? Matter of fact, you are going to make your worst decisions ever it, when you are in a fit of rage. Okay? Hey, we have some new people on there. How's everyone doing out there? Uh, I can't say your name. In the, Dina? I'm trying to say that. I, Dina? Anyway, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, but you know what? When we are in a fit of rage, all rational thought processes are out the window. And how many times have we say, that's it, I'm done with you, I'm selling this thing, or I'm getting rid of it. We, we say the most ridiculous, stupid things. Okay? And thank God we don't act on them. But we do say that. Okay? We do say that. So what do we have to do, people? What what's is the... What's the solution about losing control? Well, I'm going to give you a, a big brainstorm here today, tonight. Don't do it. Stay in control. Walk away. Take a deep breath. And remember what the Word of God says, that anger rests in the bosom of fools. That's what the Word of God says. Meaning, if you're in a place of great adversity, again, medically, physically, emotionally, financially, in a relation, children, business, whatever it is, spiritually, losing control is not your friend. In matter of fact, it is your greatest enemy. It is an enemy. Losing control. And if we can look at it as an enemy, it's an easier way to keep it under control. Say, when I see that, I, I hate it. I don't want to. A great thing to do is to record yourself. I remember I was counseling, uh, well, let's see, what is um, Marion posted here? Halt. H-A-L-T. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. <laughs> Okay? Uh, that's, you know what, when we're tired, we get angry. When we're hungry, we get angry. Uh, but I was going to say something, and I lost my train of thought, and I forgot what I was going to say. But anyway, when we lose control, we bring to ourselves sometimes worse things than the thing that made us lose control. Let me say that again. Sometimes when we lose control... We make the situation worse than the thing that made us lose control. Because we react instead of rethink. Okay? Don't react, rethink the situation. Don't react, rethink the situation. Because it only breeds bad decisions, hurt feelings, and sometimes if we go too far, we bring ourselves to a place that we have crossed the line, right? How many times in marriages and stuff like that, relationships, when anger gets to the point where it becomes physical, you've crossed the line, people. There is never, ever, ever, ever a reason to physically push, hurt, slap anyone. Okay? Now, I'm not talking about self-defense, you know, if you get mugged or something, defend yourself. But in a conversation with anyone, okay, there's never an excuse to let it get physical. And, you know, we've, we've seen it happen, and you know it happens. Oh, I remember what I was going to say. I remember I was counseling uh, this one family, and they were having problems with their child that was out of control and doing crazy things and I told them, I said, do me a favor, 
record the episodes so I can hear them. And I'll do that a lot with people. I said, let me, I need to hear what's going on. So they came and they played back and I said, wow, that's pretty out there. And uh, I told them, I tell you what I want to do. I want you to get your child and I want you to play back to them how they sound. Because I tell you, when we, if, if we can hear back how we sound and what we look like when we lose control, we would never do it again. Because it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. I've been embarrassed of myself. As I think, you know, as I've thrown something more. You know, just, I remember, true story, okay, you could ask my wife this. I remember when we were first married and we were living in our little appointment in Rocky Point, Long Island, New York. We had this little tiny, tiny apartment in the basement of my grandma's house, and we were only married a short time, and we were fight. I don't know what we were, you know, isn't that funny? Most of the stuff you fight about, you don't even remember. You just remember the fight, but you don't remember why. And I remember I really lost my temper. I took a pillow, like a, a couch pillow, and I threw it. And, you know, when you get married, they give you those two champagne glasses with our with, with like the husband and wife's initials engraved in them. It was a special gift. We had them up on a thing, and I hit it by accident, and I broke the glasses. Never get them back again. And that was very profound because, you know, I was like, wow, I am so sorry. You know, I did something that I, could, I can't go back from. And sometimes God is going to allow things like that to happen to see how silly we can get and how much hurt we can bring upon. I mean, the hurt that might have come to you that made you lose control, sometimes the hurt that you give back is even worse than what you got. But anyway, I want to read you with the time we have some scriptures. Because does the Word of God say anything about losing control? Does he say anything about losing our temper? What does he say about it? Well, he absolutely does. Absolutely does. Okay? Uh, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 31, it says, Let all, all anger, wrath, bitterness, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Don't be bitter. Bitter is the ugly friend of anger. Okay? Psalm 37 8. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Other than righteous anger, which is very few and far in between that we ever are in that state of righteous anger, we could have righteous anger. Most of the time, when we get angry, it's not righteous anger. God says, don't do it. Okay? Psalm 86, 15. Okay? God gives us an example. We're supposed to look to him as our object lesson, our example, our role model. Not object lesson, but a role model. In Psalm 86, 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and in truth. People, mercy and truth. Mercy and truth. You tie those two things around your neck, you'll be successful. God is filled with plenty of mercy and truth, and He is long-suffering. You don't hear that word, it's called, it's kind of an old English word, long-suffering, but it's really a self-explanatory word. It says what it is. Someone who suffers long, and they do it well. Okay, it's a positive word. It means I am able to suffer, you know, rebuke and things thrown at me, and I'm patient. I'm not saying that I am, but that's what God is. And isn't it great that God is full of compassion and He is long-suffering? May we be also. Okay, Proverbs 14, 29. And I always tell you guys, you want easy to understand words from the Bible for 
daily existence in the you know the ups and downs of just work and school and just finances and family the book of proverbs is your place to go for daily wisdom on how to live the life of a human okay proverbs 14:29 he that is slow to anger is of great understanding but he that is hasty of spirit exalts folly. Okay, now it's a little bit tricky there. Those who are slow to get anger, they are very wise. They understand things. But he that is hasty to get angry, he only increases trouble for himself or herself. If you are always a person who is always quick to get angry and fly off the handle, you are going to invite trouble more than favor and good things. You're going to invite, you're going to be a person who attracts the dark cloud of adversity. Did you know people that everywhere they go, everything is tense? There's always some kind of you know, you get, like you're afraid to go out with this person because you know if the waitress doesn't give them the right change or somebody doesn't look at them the right way, or somebody takes their parking spot, you know this person is going to flip out. You know, I know there's people that I've been with in a car, and I know when I, if I'm going to be driving with this person and they're going to drive, it's going to be a rough road because they lose their temper, they're cutting people off, they're cursing. I know that's how some people get. But isn't it more amazing and more godlike to just say, there you go. Get in that spot, person. I know you got to get that special spot in front of me. You know, in traffic, isn't that, you know, it's so crazy. In traffic, we get so incensed. We're so easily angered. We want to go kill someone. But what's the point? You know what? You want to get into this guy's like, you got the secret lane, okay? that everyone else has, you know, let the guy get in front of you. You'll find a couple of traffic lights down that you'll both pull up. Now, after that guy's gone in and out, cursed, screamed, beeped, you both pull up at the same spot, and you have no stress, and his blood pressure is through the roof, people. Drama, yes. Do you know people who attract drama? Do you know people that everywhere they go, it's drama? You could go up to 7-Eleven to get a cup of coffee, it'll be drama. You talk to them, it's drama. And that's my prayer. I always say, Lord, don't bring me people to my church who cause drama. And God's been good because usually people who bring drama, God takes them away quickly. Because we don't need drama, people. There's enough drama out in the world. Why do I want to add drama to my life? Okay. Uh, Proverbs 15.1. And this is so true, people, so true. We know it's true because it's the word of our Creator, the one who made our DNA. He knows what's best. Proverbs 15, 1, A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. And I hate to use the same stories, but I, I always come to this story. And I like to do this a lot. It really works well. It's just a fun, you know, after a while, it becomes a fun thing to do. When someone is coming to talk to you and they are ready, you know, they got fire in their eyes. If you respond with love and calmness, they don't know what to do. They're dumbfounded. And, you know, when people, when someone's coming and they're ready to knock horns, they want you to engage. And... And most people do engage. You talk to me like that, I'm going to talk to you like that. They want it. But when you don't respond in like manner, the human mind doesn't know what to do. Okay? And this just happened I, maybe like two years ago. I was getting gas at Sam's Club. And I didn't. there was a long line of gas. And I pulled in. And I didn't see. I really didn't. That this lady, you know, supposed, supposedly was next in line. So I get out of my car and I start get ready to pump my gas and this lady gets out of her car and starts screaming. 
That was my spot. What are you doing? I said, I am so sorry. And not sarcastically. I totally apologize. I said, let me put this pump away. I'll stop this order and you can pull right in. You know what? Immediately, she didn't know what to say. She says, ah, ah forget it. <laughs> because everyone's looking. I did the right thing. She did the foolish thing. Most people would just say, oh, yeah? Well, you should have been. You know, and then you know what happens. You see people out there. People, the word of God is proved out every day. Every day it's proved out. God says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. If someone's ticked off in a bad way, I tell you this, you respond to them ticked off in a bad way, they're going to be even more ticked off in a bad way, and it's going to get nasty. Someone has to be the calming spirit. You want to see favor? Because you know what? Who looks foolish? Who looks foolish when they're out of control? And you act calmly. You're the wise one, right? That's why God, right? What is you know? God gave us two ears and one mouth. We should listen twice as much as we speak. Uh, let's see, Proverbs uh, fifteen eighteen. A wrathful person stirs up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeases strife. Okay, someone who has a spirit of wrath, anger, again, they stir up problems. It's like a magnet to these people. Okay, and that's not how we should be. We're supposed to, what did, what did Jesus say in the Beatitudes? He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Right? Happy are those who are trying to always mediate. You see two people, you get in the middle, try to calm them down. God says, those who are peacemakers, God has a special reward for you. Also, there's also a warning from God. If you know people who lose their control, who lose their temper, well, there is a warning for those of us who maybe don't, okay? Proverbs 22, 24 through 26. Make no friendship with an angry person. And with a furious person, do not go near them. Don't be, if you have a person in your life who's constantly out of control and angry, you know, oh, well, you might say, well, I'm married to the person. Well, you're going to have to get some help. But you know what? Walk away. Walk away and don't engage. People, don't engage. Don't engage. That is the key. So many fights are, are subdued if you don't engage. And over the years, I've been a pastor, I don't know, 17 years now, I guess, people coming to my office over the years, there's always been a couple who, you know, got some complaint about something, or they're like ready to just, you know, bite off my head. And I, I try to, not that I always do, but for the most part, you know, because you know what? There's that button that people push and it like turns on that fight mode, you know? We all have that fight or flight mode. And it's hard to subdue. But if you catch yourself quickly, normally when people come at me like that, I'll say, I am so sorry. Maybe I did something that I didn't know. If I did, I apologize. Okay, if I said that to you or I said something that offended you, I am so sorry. That's not what I intended. And it's amazing. They go from level 10 right down to level 2, and they don't know what to do. They just don't know what to do because they want to engage. They want you to respond the same way they did. And when, you know, and I've shared people, I've shared so many times, okay, the apology, the power of a, and, I, and I'm still trying to get this into people's heads. I see so many people who have never followed my lead on this. But there is a massive power in apology. I'm getting the watch look here. Get that going. The power of the apology. God blesses those who know how to apologize. Okay? But no one ever wants to. 
Okay. Anyway, uh, let's give uh, let's read Proverbs 22. We're going a little bit late here. There's a couple of more minutes. Uh, verse 26. Be not one of them that strike hands. Don't be somebody who raises hands and is quick to just go up there, okay? An angry man, Proverbs 29, 22, stirs up strife, and a furious man abounds in transgressions. You're going to have trouble follow you all the days of your life. Anyway, uh, I hope this helped you guys. Try to stay in control. Try to be in control. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that we're never going to lose our tempers again. We probably will. I probably will. But it's never the place to go. It's never the answer. Uh, you know what? Any Anyone who's in law enforcement, anyone who knows about how to keep a situation from escalating is to bring a sense of order and calmness. If someone's already out of control, you flipping out is not going to bring them into control. The voice of reason and calmness will bring people into a place where they can be subdued and you can then speak rational to them. I know our songs playing means we're out of time, but last note, you can't have a conversation with someone rationally who's out of control. You got to get the insanity away before you even try to dialogue okay so walk away if you have to anyway that's it for tonight don't forget we have something going on every night this week stay tuned to our channels don't forget to subscribe to our youtube page thank you so much and we'll see you next time on life talk live